Welcome to Community Health Matters. I'm your host, Amy Marsalis. In today's show, we'll hear from a male survivor of breast cancer. Learn how Tennessee fared in the 2016 Senior Report from America's Health Rankings and talk about how to identify and address youth substance abuse. All of that coming up next on Community Health Matters. Channel 5 Network, this is Community Health Matters, sponsored by the United Health Foundation. I'm so pleased to have Wayne Dornan as my first guest today on our show. As you saw, author, consultant, and breast cancer survivor. Nice to have you here today with us. It's a pleasure to be here. And here is his book, uh, How I Survived Breast Cancer, uh, written by Wayne. Uh, you said your, your first book, of course, you've been an academic, so you've written mm -hmm. a lot of articles. But mm -hmm. uh, I imagine this was somewhat cathartic for you, too, to write this book about your experience. And as a man, going through breast cancer treatment, I imagine you still would encounter people who would say, what? Mm -hmm, absolutely. A man getting breast cancer? Mm -hmm. uh, share with us some of the numbers and, sure. and, and, and kind of the feedback you get from people. Okay, well actually I was one of those men because at the time I had the diagnosis, I had no clue that men could get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And to give an example, this year they estimate that about 250,000 women in the United States will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer and you compare to that to about 3,400 men. So there's a huge difference in the number of cases mm -hmm. of women compared to men. So what that translates into though is that most men are not aware that they can get breast cancer. And what happens then is when they finally do go to a doctor and are diagnosed with breast cancer, the stage, which ranges from stage one to four, and the higher the number, the worse the diagnosis, their stage is higher compared to women and as a result their prognosis is poor so mm -hmm. we've really got to get the word out to men that we have breasts too and if mm -hmm. we have breasts we can get breast cancer and you share this experience I would imagine in great detail uh, I've just skimmed through this a little bit just now mm -hmm. but um, what you've been through I see you know there's some pictures in here um, and hormone receptor positive some charts various things mm -hmm. um, why was it important for you to write this book and to share this mm -hmm. well the ver from the very beginning when I was diagnosed I knew I was going to write a book because one of the things I realized very quickly is that there was a lack of information out there for men I, I researched the, the, the literature and there was absolutely no publications and no books about male breast cancer. So I wanted to get that out. I wanted to share my specific journey because to be honest, when I was first diagnosed, I was embarrassed. Uh, I felt that, well, why couldn't I have been diagnosed with a male form of breast cancer. In my wildest dreams, I did not ever think that I was going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share that personal story that it's not nothing to be embarrassed about. It's a disease that you have to deal with just like anything else, else and you have to come out and try and get information about what's going on within you. The second reason why I wanted to write the book was because even in women, there's a lot of misconceptions about breast cancer. So being an academic with 35 years of experience in research, I wanted to go into the scientific literature and then put in some factual information into that book to say, you know what? Breast cancer is bad, there's no doubt about it, mm -hmm. but the treatment within the last decade has changed dramatically and so has survival rates, and I wanted to put that in the book. So that is, is encouraging to people as well. Absolutely. Like don't, don't be afraid and neglect getting a mammogram or treatment because you think, well, what if I do have it? It's a death sentence, it's not. No, absolutely not. What, was your, what were your symptoms? How were you diagnosed? Well, uh, 
I had really no symptoms uh, until about three days before I was diagnosed. I was in the shower, and just like a typical male, I'm not doing self-examinations. I'm just going through life worrying about testicular cancer, mm -hmm. not breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I was in the shower, and I noticed that, that my left breast felt different. And when I got out of the shower, I went to the mirror, and I looked, and my nipple was inverted. And that is, little did I know at the time, that's a telltale sign sign of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So m I inherited hypochondria from my mother oh, oh. and so I didn't put it off because most men put those things off and I immediately called my physician. This was a Friday morning, went to see him. He sent me to get a mammogram and most uh, centers don't do mammograms on men for obvious reasons. They do ultrasounds. So I had the ultrasound done on Friday afternoon, it came back suspicious. I was referred to a surgeon on Monday morning, and he saw my breast and did a, a biopsy on Wednesday, which was my birthday. Mm. I was in surgery. Wow. Mm, yeah, it oh, was a quick whirlwind. Whirlwind. Mm -hmm. So recommendations. You brought up ma so mammograms, ultrasound in, in your case. What are the recommendations for mammograms? For women, they begin typically at 45, mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. For men, when do they recommend you start well, or have it's, them? Well, it's very interesting that you bring that up because I was at a conference, a survivor conference in Washington, D.C. about three weeks ago. And uh, we, there were a bunch of advocates that were there with scientists. And the role of the conference was to get us both together. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the scientists are so deep in the weeds of what they're doing Doing, they lose the perspective of what they're working on and so that was the motivation of behind the conference and so each advocate stood up and talked about his or her well it was just one male and it was all mm -hmm. women about our diagnosis of breast cancer and I had a woman come up to me just before the plenary session and say you know I have two sons I've had breast cancer my mother died of breast cancer and my grandmother died of breast cancer. What do I do with my sons? I said to her, they're high risk. They need to know that they are high risk and they need to do annual examinations. Mm -hmm. Let's, in our last uh, 30 seconds, mm -hmm. this has gone so quickly, uh -huh. let's go over other risk factors sure. real quickly in the last about 30 seconds. Okay, well, there's some risk factors that you can't do anything about. That's age, ethnicity, and gender. But one of the biggest risk factors for breast cancer that is a strong association is obesity. Get out there, exercise, watch your weight, and that will go a long way for, me, for you avoiding getting diagnosed with breast cancer. All right, I, we could go on and on. I wish we had more time. Wayne Dornan, thank you. You're How I Survived welcome. Breast Cancer is his book. Thank you for sharing your experience, and we're glad to know you're doing well. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very Wayne. much. All right, we'll be right back. Screen that Dr. Karen Cassidy is with United Healthcare. She's also an internist and a pediatrician. Did that in your previous life. Correct. You still Correct. are a doctor, but you're right. in an administrative position. So tell us about these healthcare rankings, America's Health Rankings, and this is a senior report specifically. Correct. So recently the specific report for seniors came out. But just to give you a little background yeah. on American Health Rankings, this is the longest running kind of really snapshot. We see both of the country kind of as a holistic overview, but mm. the individual mm -hmm. states are ranked as well, which I think is really helpful. Um, and this is put out by the United Healthcare Foundation mm -hmm. and the American Public Health Association, as well as a partnership with um, Partners for Prevention. And so it really, it's a very nice, actionable report that comes out that really lets a state specifically look at where there's areas of opportunity for improving the health of their citizens. So how did we do? Where are we doing well and where are we maybe falling a little behind? Right, so you know, Tennessee um, was 43rd for seniors in general out of 50 states, which obviously is not where we want to be. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be in that bottom third. The good news is that we did improve. We were 44th last year. So 
moving up mm -hmm. one point, so we mm -hmm. need to be pleased with that, but obviously something we need to continue to have focus on and build on. You know, when we look, there's 35 specific measures they look at, and they're looking at um, kind of risk factors for disease, chronic disease and illness, so things like obesity and activity, um, diabetes, but also looking at things like availability of physicians in the area or how many people die in a hospital-based setting, and then also kind of social contributors to health and well-being, things like what are your stress levels, um, is there enough food in the house, things like that. So it's a very comprehensive snapshot and overview. You had mentioned prior to us uh, beginning the segment today uh, food insecurity that yeah. a lot of our seniors have. What, what does that mean really? So there's pluses and minuses for our seniors in Tennessee. Um, you know, the plus is where we have a really low rate. We're actually number one in the country for um, not having excessive alcohol consumption. So a really good thing. Great. Um, we were number six for vaccinations for seniors. Great. Um, a lot of times we think of vaccines as something that kids do, but there's some real specific like vaccines. Pneumonia, shingles. Exactly, some of those. Okay. exactly. Important uh, mm -hmm. vaccines for seniors beginning. Um, but we did see, and this is kind of odd, one of the positives that was listed is that our obesity rates went from 34th in the country. We're now fifth. So good that less obese seniors, but the kind of the caveat to that or the, the I guess the hard part of that was we ranked really high for food insecurity. Not getting enough food, not getting well, enough to and not eat. Not knowing when your next meal where your next meal's coming from. So we're 46 for food insecurity, and we were 48th in the uh, country for availability of home delivered meals for seniors in need. That's really changed over the years, hasn't it? It seems like people used yeah. to there were Meals on Wheels or different programs, and you said there are programs. Maybe there seniors are programs. don't know about there them. There surely are programs, and actually, um, Tin Care is a very robust long term care program that has home delivered meals as part of what they provide. But I think it's really telling that that's an issue. You know, also our seniors ranked very high. They were 49th for um, being under a high level of stress or having poor mental health days. Um, you know, very high rate of smoking. So I think I th when I see that and I think about that, boy, looking into your neighborhood, looking at your, you know, your church population or, you know, people, uh, you know, around the corner or, or near you, trying to make sure that you're reaching out and offering support. I think even just that little bit of contact probably would make a difference to the seniors in our oh, community. Oh, for sure. You, a lot of people don't know their neighbors anymore, and if you do have elderly people in Absolutely. your neighborhood, a lot of them might be alone and not have anybody checking on them. That's an important thing to mention. So as you look to the future, let's say the population of 2030, uh, what kind of information have you gleaned from this report to help the, the future. Uh, what, yeah, what and 2030 was actually that baby boomer year mm -hmm. that they've looked at, so that those people aging into that over 65 category, and they looked at those people coming up in that 14 year span to say, boy, what will our senior population look like in 2030? And boy, it's remarkably different. 50% less smokers in that senior population coming in 2030 versus now, but a much higher rate of diabetes. 53% of them have diabetes, 53% more, excuse me, have diabetes and a 25% increase in obesity in that population. So we're really looking at a very different dynamic at the group that's coming in or aging into that senior population versus what we have now. A lot of similar problems that we see just across the state of Tennessee with obesity and diabetes. And so what do you do to try to make an impact impact on, on that. Yeah, I mean, diet and exercise is just such an important thing for health in general, you know, whether we're talking about diabetes or cancer risk. Um, so really getting out, exercising, thinking about healthy diet, you know, um, healthiertennessee.org is a wonderful, excuse me, .com is a wonderful website that's put out that has some really great um, kind of actionable tips or ways to get started, both for an individual or a family or even uh, a small workplace or, or congregation. There's information on how to kind of promote healthier lifestyle. I want to go back to one thing you said earlier in this final minute or so that we have mm -hmm. mental health and what uh, that issue for seniors. What is underlying, what's the underlying reason for that? Do you really understand? What you know, this report tells us that score is low. It really doesn't look at those causal factors. But I do think it's something the state needs to back up and look at. But when you think about someone, and like you were saying, we don't know our neighbors and we're not maybe reaching out the way that we should. I think um, making sure people have connections and contacts. And also when you think about things like food insecurity, 
I'm not surprised you have poor mental health days if you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from. Mm -hmm. So I think those global supports and sense of community and wrapping that around our elderly population is just really important. I think so too. Again, connections. Absolutely. Um, and, and for people to get more information on this topic, uh, whoever's watching, that someone that might want a little more information on this, uh, where can you direct them to go? You, you mentioned a website. Is there is there any so other organization American, to call? AmericansHealthRankings.org um, actually has this report on uh, the website. But there are ways, I think, through different churches in the area that you could reach out. There are um, uh, specific uh, community resources for the elderly. You could reach out and potentially volunteer or become a part of that. So I think there's other ways to reach out and get involved. Um, in your area and supporting our elderly population. Okay. Like, like you said, whether it's your neighborhood, your churches, Absolutely. wherever you may be interacting with these folks. Thank you. Dr. Karen Cassidy, appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks okay. for having me. Uh -huh. We'll be right back. If you haven't already heard of the STARS program, you're going to learn from an expert. She's been with the program 20 years. Regina Guest, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, there are counselors, I realize, at high schools. Right. This is not the same kind of setup. What makes your program different, and who are you trying to reach at the school? Yeah, that's right. We are a little bit different. What we do is we try to address issues that deal with social and emotional barriers to learning. So we're not about necessarily the schedules, or I want them to have great mm -hmm. GPAs, but we're looking at other issues that impact them in the school itself. Um, we're in six middle Tennessee counties. We provide education, um, counseling, early intervention, and we connect our families and students and their families to local resources as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, full circle. Yes. What are some of the, the, the prevalent issues that you're seeing in the student population? Are we specifically looking at substance abuse issues mm -hmm. or other things? Well, other things. And whatever they present with, right now there are a lot of mental health issues that are going on right now, I'm dealing with anxiety, trying to self-regulate emotions. Uh, of course, substance use is always a constant. That's in any school, in any county, mm -hmm. in any district. Um, and um, just pure connectedness and uh, school connectedness. So it just, it's just a wide range of things that we address. Whatever the student presents with, that's where we go. That it's an emotional or social barrier to learning in the school. To learning, okay, obviously if you're having mental health issues or substance issues, that is definitely a barrier to mm -hmm. learning. Are you seeing more of that? Because you have the history of being there 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you're at Franklin High School. I'm at Franklin said, High School, In yes. Williamson County. Right. So have you seen the issues with mental health the problems I have seen growing it skyrocket. Why? Why um, do you think that is? Is it access to social media where you and the peer pressure, all of that ties together? I know we, we talked a little bit about that in a previous program. Is that all interconnected? I, I think so, but I also think it's just it it's just the times that we're dealing with right now. There's just so much going on with our kids and um, parents are very ac active, you know, they're employed, they don't have as much time to mm -hmm. spend with their kids. It's just coming from a lot of different directions. Um, uh, social skills, um, maybe some things just are not diagnosed or now mm -hmm. they are being diagnosed better. Um, so you may maybe would connect a student that you identify as having a mental health issue with a health care provider or at least contact the parents and get that in motion to help the student. You, you connect if needed, the people but if also needed. also just helping that student be able to uh, be in the school and go throughout their day, you know, giving them skills, coping skills and uh, interventions that will help them to academically still be okay in the school. If they don't come to you and knock on your door, mm -hmm. um, Ms. Guess, I'm having an issue, because let's face it, a lot of kids are not going to do that. And some do. Some and do. some do, though. Some do, but also there's another way that they can uh, come to see me. Um, we have an internal referral system where the staff, administrators, the entire school is educated at the beginning of the year of how they can make referrals, what to look for in kids. Uh, they come that way. Sometimes I just get parents that call me and say, I'm concerned about my child. 
uh, would you mind talking to them and finding out what's going on with them and so you know have to go that way as well and assess what's going on. If they're not receptive to mm -hmm. you yeah. What what is the next step when they're not receptive? When they're not receptive, and if it's not if it's a minor thing, sometimes we just get the teen angst, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the next step would probably be a telephone call to their parents and just letting them know the services were offered and, and that they declined. Um, but most of the time, they they are pretty receptive. We're we're in the school. They see us. They know us. Um, it's you get less resistance. Because of the familiarity. The, exactly, exactly. They see you around. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you identify a student who's having some issues, mm -hmm. so what are the steps that you follow to deal with that particular behavior? Well, um, when I identify that a student has a problem, I try to find out, you know, um, just what what's really going on. You have to build a rapport and everything. And I just forgot what I was going to say. No, I hope we don't throw no, it all we'll, the way no, over. No, that's okay. <laughs> Let's go on to the next question. Okay. How successful has the program okay. been so far? Because I know you have good yes, outcomes. We have good outcomes. We're seeing increase with um, academics. We're seeing increase with school connectedness. Less tardies, less absences. Um, just more connected to, to school extracurricular activities. Wow. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different things, a lot of different successes that way. We're seeing students that um, were on the potential of failure for graduation, wow. you know. Uh, and you can intervene and you can make intervene a difference. intervene and help with that, yes. Do you do you work with the other counselors at school? Yes, yes. How, how does that relationship work? Where it's, it's a very collaborative relationship. That's I just great. had a situation this morning where I was working with a counselor, and so we're back and forth with that. Um, sometimes they will make referrals as well. Uh, oftentimes at my school, in particular, they will introduce a student to me as another support in the school, so that the student knows these are other places you can go as well. So there's follow up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's I would it's think would be an important Absolutely. piece of all of this. Um, now I know that you also have a way of students or parents if someone's watching right. and they mm -hmm. want to know. Okay, how do I how do I connect with her? Okay. Is there some kind of phone number or website? You can or call any Middle Tennessee High School, Middle School, ask for the Star Specialist or Stars Counselor, whichever you prefer, and you can contact us. We're also located on the website starsnashville.org. Starsnashville.org. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's is there a helpline as well? Well, or? we don't have a helpline connected to ours, but to you know, I mean, drug free. Uh, Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, that's, a, that's a, 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 a nice website as well. Um, you can call OASIS Center. I don't have their phone. I mm -hmm. think it's 327-4455. Okay. Um, but the simplest way is just to make contact with us at the schools. And, and you want to just say, don't be intimidated Not to at come all. in. I get parents that you can come in, you can call. I get parents all the time that kind of want coaching, mm -hmm. how to talk to other parents who you feel like may also be having the same oh. problem and that kind of thing. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, You're Regina. Welcome. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you as Thank well. you. And we'll be right back with more after this. Thank you for watching Community Health Matters. Learn more ways to improve your health at mycommunityhealthmatters.org. And remember, here in Middle Tennessee, our community health matters.